So ChatGPT and Google's Bard and uh, Bing Chat are all what are called large language models. Well, what do people mean when they use the word language? I've been interested in that question for quite a while um, because I've been a language teacher, language educator, running language programs at a university. And um, during that time, I've discovered that people have a lot of different understandings of the word language, um, surprisingly. Uh, sometimes co quite deep controversies and disagreements about what language is, what language means. So now that we have these new language things, these new language models, I thought it might be a good time to sort of reflect on what um, meanings the word language has had for people um, until now, and what those understandings might mean for us as we try to figure out what these new devices, these new things, <laughs> these new chat, these new chat things, when we try to decide what they are and what they mean and how we should understand them and interact with them. So, um, first of all, um, I, I, as I said, my biggest exposure to the idea of language and to the problems of language come from learning other languages and teaching other languages. Um, and one thing I've discovered is that um, there's this very distinct and wide spectrum of understandings of the word language. So on one end of that spectrum, we have what, um, well, what I would call the sort of the cognitive, the mental view of language. So this is a view that um, language consists of certain distinct component parts. There are the sounds of the words we say, and there are the words themselves that we have. And then we put those words into sentences in, in the form of using grammar. Um, and then maybe grammar, if grammar is focused on the sentence, we could also have a grammar of paragraphs, a grammar of discourses. But it's often very much a focus on those component parts. You know, what are the correct sounds of a particular language? What's the correct grammar? Um, and, and it's some people and some educators, when they're teaching or learning languages, um, focus very much on those parts. So as, um, when I was learning languages when I was young, um, I, I tended to focus on those things. You know, I'm, how much vocabulary did I have? Was I pronouncing the the individual sounds of the of the other language correctly or not? Was I forming sentences with the correct grammar? Um, and that was, you know, as, when I was young, I found that to be quite useful, and um, I enjoyed that, that aspect of language. But then there are other people who regard sort of language as something very, very different. Language is something we humans use to do things with each other. So it's it, the important thing these those people believe is not the you know the, what the sounds we make or the the words we use is do we accomplish what we want to accomplish are we negotiating with somebody are we having a, a friendly conversation with somebody are we trying to convince somebody of something are we trying to sell something um, are, you know, are we trying to ask directions on the street to use a very typical example from from language education and so. People who have that focus on language as something that we use to mostly an interaction as an action, as an interaction with other people, um, they tend to um, not pay so much attention to the little bits and pieces and not care so much whether the bits and pieces are correct. Um, so you can imagine, for example, somebody who has to conduct a business negotiation, they want to form an agreement with a company in another in another country, and they're they're negotiating about that, and you can imagine a bad negotiator whose language is absolutely correct. Who's every every sentence is correct, the pronunciation is perfect, but they're a lousy negotiator. And you can imagine on the other side um, somebody who's a, a very skillful negotiator whose whose use of that second language is not so great. You know, who has a strong foreign accent and makes a lot of mistakes. Oh, so, so for people on that end of the spectrum, this, let's call that the social end of, of language, um, they, they um, don't care so much about the correctness of, of it. So both, and 
both of these extremes have their, you know, their good points. They're valid points. I can also, I can see the, the point of now that I'm older, I tend to value that, that sort of what you can do with language more than how accurate your details are. But both are important. And then, of course, this is, those are the two ends of the spectrum, the cognitive end and the social end. Um, and then in between, if you imagine how, you know, language is taught in schools and how textbooks are arranged, they tend to kind of move between them. You know, so uh, some, some uh, approaches to teaching and learning focus very much on the more the cognitive details of grammar. Others focus more on practical purposes, and there are a lot of textbooks and lesson plans that, that combine them both. Okay. But, I, but what I want, the reason I want to use that spectrum as a way of thinking about language is that especially the people on the two ends, when they say the word language, when they hear the word language, they're thinking about their side of things. Okay, and they can get quite emotional and quite angry about suggestions that language is something other than that. And then people who, who don't um, you know, think so much about language, you know, who have other things to do in their lives, um, they might have kind of a, uh, a, 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 some, some of a vague idea of what, of what language is, of how to think about language. And so what, 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 what are these large language models then? What did you chat GPT and the rest? Um, how should we think about them in terms of their use of language? And so I think... Um, well, first of all, I have, they've only been out, you know, available, widely available for a few months. But they, in some ways, they look very much like human language on both sides of the spectrum, okay? So that they are able to produce, you know, accurate grammar, and they're, you know, remarkably accurate grammar, especially in the case of English. Um, and, um, you know, the, their use of words are, is quite, quite good, quite good. Very much like a very, very skilled human in some ways. And on the other, and in terms of interaction and doing things, I'm, so this is what was the most surprising thing for me about ChatGPT is that you can kind of have a conversation with it, and it, and, it, and it seems kind of friendly and understanding, and and so it it, it is able to it seems to be able to use language in that um, practical, social applied way. Of course, it's still limited to a text interface at at this point when I'm making this video. But um, on the other hand, there are a lot of differences um, between human language on both ends of the spectrum and these language models. Okay, so um, first of all, that accuracy, the fact that they're very accurate, um, no human is that accurate, okay? So I have yet to see a grammatical mistake or a vocabulary mistake in any of the English produced by ChatGPT and my interactions with it. Um, I, I, I'm a native speaker of English, a professional language user. I cannot produce page after page after page of, of written English with no errors. I leave out words. I use the wrong words. Sometimes I spell something wrong. Okay, and so so that that extremely high accuracy is something that that we humans don't have. Um, it's also very fast. So um, <laughs> you know, it just spits out text very very quickly, much faster than any human being um, can. So that's one, uh, obviously, one difference. Um, I, but I think I, I, maybe a more important difference than, than just its sort of <laughs> superhuman um, speed and competence, um, in some ways, is the fact that it's not um, it's, it's not embodied in a, in a human body. And so if there are, they, they, at, the, at this point, none of these bots have personalities, and they don't have identities, and they don't have names even, other than just sort of an artificial name. Um, and so um, the fact that they're not, that they don't have personalities also means they, they don't have, you know, I don't think they have any desires or motivations. Or if, if they could show desires or motivations, OpenAI and the other companies seem to have done their best to suppress that. So they, they you know, humans, when humans, especially when you think about the use of language on the interactive side, on the social side, Humans use language to do things because they w want to do things, they desire to do things, they need to do things. Um, and so that is is not, in the current generation of language models, that is not yet apparent. And, and they're not in human bodies either, so they don't, they don't get sleepy, they don't get tired, 
they don't get stomach upsets that interfere with their their um, their use of language. They don't get don't don't seem to get into a bad mood or in a, or into a good mood. They don't have moods at all. Okay, and so um, those, especially when we think about the language on the more sort of interactive social side for human language, those are all very important things. Is how 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 is this other person feeling? Well, what is this other person thinking? What does this other person want to do? So, um, in the discussions I've seen on online and elsewhere about these language models, and whether they are really using language or not, on our you know do they do they really have understand meaning? Do they really have knowledge about things? Um, well, those are all those are all important questions to be thinking about. But also, especially on the question of you know are they really using language? How skillful are they at, are at language? Um, I think it would be useful to keep in mind the fact that we human beings have different understandings of what language means. Okay, so you might want to use this opportunity to reflect on your own assumptions about what does it mean to be able to use a language well? Does it mean to be able to use it without errors? Or does it mean to be able to, to <laughs> have a, converse with somebody, to convince somebody of something? So some people might be thinking about uh, these models um, in terms of the grammar and the vocabulary and uh, those little bits and pieces of the cognitive parts of language, th the parts of language that are, can be done by people themselves but alone if they want to. And other people will be focusing on the, on the interaction and, uh, and the accomplishment of tasks that they can do um, using, using language. Um, and others will a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who are not, you know, specialists in the field, who maybe who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about language or studying a language, uh, studying languages, will be uh, a little bit confused, a little bit uncertain about how to think about these um, these large language models. And so um, I made this video just to kind of bring this issue to the fore. Um, it's it's these new things are amazing and frightening. And they're going to be changing society. They're already starting to change society. And so in terms of their use of language, um, well, I, I encourage you to sort of reflect on how you understand language, how you've thought about language, how the people you interact with think about language. And um, use that when you're trying to figure out what these new language models, new language things are and how we should deal with them. So thank you very much for listening.